Hello YouTube. Um, I wanted to do a video today on one of the images that I took um, quite early last year of the California Nebula. This is a very beautiful object in the night sky. It, it It's ahead of Orion so it'll always be between the Milky Way and the Orion season but it's not far from the Pleiades. It's a reasonably big target in the night sky. This image was taken with the Officina Stellaria RH200 f3, 600mm f3, uh, QHY 600 mono camera, but in this situation I was actually using Bader filters. I'm talking about the Bader CMOS optimized uh, narrowband filters. I think they're the ultra narrowband, the way they call them. I think they're 3.5 nanometers for O3 and S2 and I believe the uh, HA is somewhere around uh, 4 or 3.5 or something like that. Anyway, it's a very affordable filter set and you know a lot of people tend to disregard these filters because uh, they're affordable than like Chromas or Astrodons or some other fancy company that sells them for you know thousands of dollars but they work well. Now that being said when you have larger stars in the field you will have to do some processing, extra processing but let's take a look and see if that's even difficult and if the image turned out well. Now, let's go to PixInsight. Uh, let's take a look. The equivalent, again, is the good old Officina Stellare RH200, the Lastrograph 200mm reflector. It is a Riccardi Honda's design. It is a typical Cassegrain with some modifications. It is very fast. It has a relatively large aperture. If you were to get a reflector this size, it would cost over $50,000 and it would be really long, uh, very long. So that's why a lot of the times reflectors are used on these space projects because they can be, they can have a huge aperture like James Webb or Hubble and not be, you know, the size of the whole rocket. So this little reflector is um, one of my favorite telescopes. It is fast, it is reliable, the mechanics on it are stunning for a reflector. A lot of the reflectors that are astrographs, like the Takahashi Epsilon or the Sharp Star, they're good if you can get them working. Most people tend to use small sensors so they can mask the errors that come with bad collimation or bad alignment. I am actually using it above spec. The spec for this telescope is 42 millimeters. My sensor is 43 and it looks great. Now, in this particular case, I was actually struggling a little bit with the collimation and some of the tilt issues. Um, and it took a while for me to figure it out along with my friend Jim, who kind of realigned it a bunch of times and then I had to deal with the tilt. Um, it is not impossible to fix. I know there's some in the community who kind of give up. It's not. If you understand the concept behind all of this and you learn to do, you learn, you learn the process of aligning it correctly. I'm still scared of the front corrector, to be honest, but I do understand how it's, how it's corrected, uh, how it's collimated. And that's what you need to know, because I think sometimes collimation is a scary word for a lot of astrophotographers. It's almost like rocket science. It's not. It's, it's complicated on very fast telescopes because any misalignment can cause stars to look like comas. But anyway, I wanted to keep this video short, so uh, let's see what we got. So let's look at the data. Again, this is done using bother filters, very affordable filters. And this is where affordability clashes with quality. Unfortunately, these filters had pretty massive halos. This happens with a lot of filter manufacturers. It's very hard to make amazing filters uh, at, at great spec. And there's also some weird, um, I think in the stack that maybe it was a, a trailing star or something. I can see some weird artifact, but um, this is something you get. It's what you pay for. It's more affordable. Now, there are some other filtered batches that don't have halos, but when it comes to oxygen, three and blue, expect halos. It's just the nature of the game. You'll have to process them out. The bigger your telescope, the harder it becomes, the bigger the star the harder it gets. But we have tools today that could make this relatively simple. So now what happened is I rotated the camera and then I collected data in different times. So the, the, the actual frame is kind of weird. It's very kind of 21 by 9 aspect ratio because I had to um, 
align it and get the best, the most nebula I could. So this is oxygen. Now the California nebula is actually here to the left, but there is the ocean of the California nebula to the right. Hydrogen looks impressive as always, the dark spots, the nebulosity is great. They actually, the, the HA filter from Butter did a great job. There is a little bit of flaring, but that's expected from a fast scope, especially at that time when I had some issues with baffling. But let me show you what I mean about tilt. So you see, as I go into the corner, the stars, the stars themselves start deforming. This isn't really an issue with the telescope, it's just alignment. And to get an idea, I think a millimeter or uh, more can deform stars, a millimeter of misalignment. That's almost like a quarter turn or less. So when you get these telescopes, they sound amazing on paper. F3, 600 millimeters, looks carbon fiber, it's amazing. But it is a specialized instrument that has to be configured properly. A lot of these telescopes that you find around used will not be properly aligned. And you'll see that because the owner uses a very, very small chip. I've seen people use a 183 chip, which is almost a quarter of a full frame. So they're hiding all of that and selling it as a working telescope, but it's not impossible to fix. There's tools, there's the Howie Glider laser collimator, there's the Hotec Advanced Laser Collimation System, all of those, if you know how to use them properly, they will help you have an incredible telescope on your hands, just like I do. And if you cannot deal with it, send me a message. I have a friend who's an expert. I am not the expert. If he can't do it for you, he will help you understand how this happens. He's built, he's been collimating telescopes for a long time, even collimates refractors, which to a lot of us is very scary. Let's look at the sulfur. Beautiful, beautiful detail in the cloud. Now there's about 20 hours here. Um, but again, these filters have different transmission curves than the chromas. 20 hours of these might be, I don't know, 15, 16 of chromas because chromas have a better transmission ratio. Um, that's just my opinion. If you think I'm wrong, leave a comment and we'll debate it. After I did all of this, I stacked the image, but furthermore, I kind of went really quick because I wanted to do a quick draft and I did a high dynamic range multi-transform with only six iterations. Usually I did nine or more. And then I quickly submitted it, sent it to a bunch of friends, uh, We'll take a look at in a sec. This is the actual stack. It's very green because there's a lot of hydrogen. I did what I said. I what I usually do. Excuse me. I removed the stars and I stressed the image. Now this is what happens with cheaper oxygen three filters. This stuff, the halos. Now, luckily here, this can be easily corrected in Photoshop. Um, that's what I corrected anyway. You literally select this, and you right click and you do fill with content aware. Photoshop is good enough that it will know how to fill this area with the relevant context. That's how I do it. I know it's not 100% scientific, but these images are more aesthetic and art than they are scientific research. They're supposed to show what's out there in a beautiful um, aesthetic format rather than kind of describing what kind of star that is, what magnitude and so forth. There's science scientists that do that with much better equipment than I have. Um, sorry for the tangent. So this is where I kind of made a mistake a little bit. I really went hard on the HDR multi-transform and according to my friend Ryan, it's a bit crunchy. <laughs> and I showed my wife who's a photographer, an award-winning photographer, this photo and she's like, it's a bit much. And then I said, well, you know, I know where the problem was. I, I backtracked to the stack. I did all of that. And then what I ended up with uh, is this. Now I did some color mixing as well. And the only thing I regret is not being able to capture the entire object. Uh, somebody online, somebody, uh, I think his name is Jeff. He's the OPT marketing director. He has an incredible image taking with a very small aperture telescope. Um, I believe it's like a 180 millimeter focal length, um, Ascal or something. He captures the entire nebula. Stunning, stunning image if you get a chance to find it. I'll link his Instagram in the video description. I can't remember his last name. I know his first name is Jeff and he's a, actually a really nice guy. I I wish I could do this. I could have the same field of view, but in the absence of that, these are $600 filters. Now, Chroma in comparison are about $3,000. It's five times cheaper. 
Now the stud itself looks okay. It's not that bad. The rest of the stars look good. I didn't do that much processing. I did blood extermin uh, blood, blood, blood exterminator, excuse me, on the stack. Then remove the stars with, with star exterminator. Stretch the image. Remove the green. Did a couple of curve adjustments and some saturation changes. Photoshop to do color mixing and to fix the the halo. Right back, noise correction, and that's it. Added the stars back in. It's a beautiful image. It reminds me of the flag of my native country, Romania, which is red, green, and blue. It's actually reversed after the communists fell, but it does look a little bit like that. I know, um, I know that's not really related to California, but that's what I was born in Romania, so it kind of resembles a little bit of the Romanian national flag. Um, not by intention, to be honest, but I think it's still a beautiful nebula. I wanted to show how you can use affordable filters to take pretty good images. I'm really happy with this. Again, I wish I could have had the field of view that Jeff had. And um, now the only thing I would say is there's people who have incredible results, even with cheaper telescopes and cameras. It's all about knowing your equipment, learning how to use it, processing it, get a get a great workflow going, and then everything else will fall in line. Uh, your instincts will, will, will come in and it will be very easy for you to create a good image, if not a great image. I really love starless images. I, I know a lot of people uh, want to see stars, but to me it's all about the nebulosity. It's about the gases, the hydrogen, the sulfur, the oxygen that's there. And I'm actually pretty happy with this image. It's not I think I will do a two by one mosaic to capture it all, maybe even get close to what Jeff had, but I'm happy, really happy with this image. I hope you guys enjoy it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to hit me up on YouTube or uh, Instagram. And thank you for watching my video and until next time.